Hey, it's Eli Sliwa, and this is my interview with Mark Leo from the Ottawa band Mecca of Stank. Please go show this funky band some funky love on their socials. Thanks a lot. Mark, how did your musical journey begin? Well, I started uh, teaching myself how to play guitar in uh, as a young teenager, you know, so I started just with that. Um, and after a while, I started messing with, uh, you know, I had a, a tape deck with uh you know, with uh you know this is kind of technology that's probably you know a little bit dated now with uh two tape decks so you could play on one side and record on the other right so i would i would use that to record loops of uh harmonies not not necessarily loops but basically i record a track and record another track with that uh first track playing you know so kind of layer a few harmonies not really know what i was doing but you know just messing with different uh i've always been self-taught you know so it was always just messing on how things would sound with different harmonies now I have a bit more knowledge about, you know, arrangements and things, but back then it was really just, you know, this note sounds like cool with this note. <laughs> and uh, so I started uh, eventually playing with, uh, playing with other people, you know, in the basement and bands. And I played, you know, high school variety show, you know, doing, doing some covers. Um, and then eventually and it wasn't for quite some time where maybe a decade later, uh, at least I joined, uh, I was living in the U S for a while and I joined an eighties tribute band or I should say we started one with the other six of us. And so, you know, we were playing, uh, eighties trip, you know, eighties covers, you know, for about five years, almost every weekend in bars. And, you know, so that was a lot of, that was my real kind of experience in terms of, um, playing in bands and, you know, playing with other people and, you know, having, a um, you know, real kind of uh, plant sets and things like that. That's really cool. I like how you have a very uh, self-made and honestly experimental background in making music. Um, yeah. So obviously the last three years have been pretty crazy, especially for the music industry. I'm just wondering how did the pandemic affect your band and were you forced to find more creative mediums in order to express and advertise your music? So it helped, it, you know, so there's two ways that, that it affected us. So, I mean, obviously we were, this band started probably uh, eight months, eight or nine months before pandemic. And we were playing once a month, you know, so we always had lots of gigs and uh, um, we're always trying out new songs, you know, we we're playing just covers at the time. And then pandemic hit, you know, the gigging stopped. So, you know, we just weren't playing anymore. We had a couple opportunities to play some live gigs in Ottawa, um, at live on Algin, you know, we had uh, one in 2020, one in 2021. So we always had the, between those windows of lockdowns where we had those opportunities to play local shows, you know, that's really not meant a lot to us after not playing for so long. Um, but really what, what I did to keep my, uh, to keep my, you know, creative uh, passions going is I was, I was doing live streams uh, every Friday on Facebook for some time, probably the first um, maybe a year or so of pandemic, you know, I was doing a uh, regular streams. So I'd have, you know, lots of friends and family and, you know, and any randoms watching. Uh, and I would just try out new songs and, you know, solo acoustic, um, obviously without the band, you know, it's a bit too hard logistically, you know, to, uh, to do that with the band. But so that was my outlet for a long time. And, uh, and then eventually, uh, uh, in the latter part of the, of the pandemic, you know, I should say, uh, about six months ago, um, because of the lockdowns we had, you know, in January and I should say uh, December, then that, that I was kind of forced to really have uh, nothing going on, no gigs. So I started to write uh, more original music and we started recording. So, uh, you know, it's only been the last six months that we've been really made an effort to push to start uh, recording. And, and a couple of the songs we already had, but uh, really make a drive to, uh, to, to write more. And I think because of lockdown, I had just had a lot more time and a lot more focus, you know, and less distractions and uh, really uh, was able to just, you know, produce and uh, start recording uh, some really good tunes. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm like how you took a very um, glass half full approach to it all, because I think some people would feel more hindered by the lockdown, but it almost seems like you thrived through it. So that's very cool to hear. Where would you say you draw the greatest musical inspiration from? Is it like a person, a particular genre? Uh, probably more of a genre. You know, there's a lot of people that I idolize. Uh, I'm not sure how much they influence my writing and my, my music, but, uh, you know, I really, really like Stevie Wonder. You know, he was always self-produced. You know, he always owned his own music. You know, he was a kind of 
one of the uh, people that really was in control of, of all of his work and owned it, you know, for all his career. Um, you know, really into Marvin Gaye um, and some of his uh, earlier work. And uh, one of the bands that really kind of changed uh, my direction a little bit was mid nineties. I discovered Jamiroquai. So I became a big Jamiroquai fan and funk and, you know, uh, at least in terms of 90s, there wasn't a whole lot of other funk going on. So uh, uh, I would say, uh, but even before that, you know, um, I would say lyrically and musically, the first person to really inspire me, I, I should, sorry, not inspire me, but in terms of speak to me, um, musically and lyrically is, uh, I'd have to say, uh, Neil Finn from uh, Crowded House. So, you know, I was always a big Crowded House fan and, you know, just, you know, how he constructs the pop songs and uh, and the structure of the songs and the words you know really uh, really kind of appeal to me very cool very cool since you have a lot of uh different inspirations there i have to say i'm uh you said stevie wonder right i'm a stevie wonder fan myself nice. uh, i think yeah especially when it comes to his funkier stuff like superstitious uh, superstitious and whatnot mm -hmm. um, i'm definitely a big fan so speaking of fans though how would you describe your fans well, it's hard to say because we're just starting to really get a you know uh, a fan base of, with, with the original music, right? So before, I would say the people that come to see us, you know, people that enjoyed funk, soul, R and B, you know, a bit of hip hop, and, and always can appreciate the kind of jazz kind of undertones. You know, there's a heavy kind of jazz influence on, on most of us in the band, so that really comes out in the music. So normally, um, you, you tend to know who those people are when they all of a sudden you see them kind of their attention get peaked and, you know, it's not just a, you know, uh, you know, power chords, <laughs> you know, it's a little more uh, complex. And, uh, um, you know, I'd say the, the, the fans we're getting now with, uh, with the release of dopamine dreams and uh, definitely a wider audience, obviously, because, you know, we're not just focused on local, local audience anymore. Um, but I would say definitely either uh, uh, the sound of that song really kind of, uh, kind of alludes itself to a uh, old school hip hop kind of vibe. Um, you know, if you go back to like the, you know, late eighties, early nineties, you know, Trap Claw Quest kind of, or Beastie Boys even before that, or Grandmaster Flash, that kind of uh, old school, you know, hip hop kind of rhyming, uh, which is very different than, 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 you know, kind of mumble rap today, right? So it's kind of a old, old school kind of vibe. And I think people kind of, the people that appreciate that old kind of hip hop, you know, B.I.G. and, uh, you know, Tupac and that kind of uh, um, 90s, especially 90s hip hop and R&B really appreciate the music. Right on. Yeah. So just lots of articulation and very like in your face, you know, absolutely. Yeah. And it's just a little more. Yeah. It's much more of a, of a lyrical kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, very different to what you hear like Drake or someone today. Right. You know, it's just it's a little just a different style. Absolutely. So I know you play bass and lead vocals for your band Mecca of Stank. Are those your favorite instruments to play? Yeah, so I've always been a you know a guitar player since a young teen, but uh, I discovered bass you know probably only seven years ago, and I realized that like I was a born bass player, but um, you know because I'm not I've only been playing for you know just a handful of that is that uh, I'm not as proficient you know so I can't really say that I'm a bass superstar, but I I'm born to play bass I, I really think in bass and I, I just love the percussion. Uh, without having, you know, I was never really a drummer outside of playing djembe and hand percussion and stuff. But, um, you know, playing the bass gives you the kind of the marriage of both, you know, playing the melodies and percussion. And uh, so that became, you know, my kind of my favorite instrument to play. Uh, and it's only in probably this band where this is the first band where I've actually had to sing and play bass at the same time, you know, before a little easier to sing guitar and play bass and, and, and to say it. it's easier to play guitar and sing. So definitely, it's a bit of a skill to play bass and sing, but, you know, I really enjoy it. So what is the story behind the name Mecca of Stank? So Stank is uh, it's an expression that musicians will use to describe what their contorted faces look like, you know, kind of when they're in the zone, when they're playing, you know. So it's it's, uh, it's an expression of musical euphoria. And it's, uh, you know, um, if I can describe it, you know, if you know what I'm talking about, it's if someone's constipated, you know, they kind of look like they're, tortured or they're you know they're sad or they're happy it's all just this kind of uh kind of tortured look and so that's that's where stank is it's the stank face and so you know mecca of stank is uh you know most of our shows uh you know we, we're, we have stank faces most of the time you know because that's that's what we thrive to just get that get to that zone where we're just reacting to the music and just kind of become oblivious to the audience you know 
Yeah, I don't know if you're a fan of EDM at all, but that's where I've yeah. most commonly heard um, the term stank face because when there's like a heavy drop or something, you know, people go, you yeah. know, just really with it. Any chance I could see your best stank face right now? Right on, right on, you know? <laughs> I guess me pumped to listen to your music. Let me just say. Yeah, it's, it's not as easy to do without without being in the zone. You know? Yeah, so yeah, for yeah. sure. But, you know, it was a great imitation and I appreciate oh, that. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so what's your favorite venue you've ever performed at and why is it? Man, it's a good question. So I played, uh, in a couple of different musical formats. And so I, I've had the ability to play some festivals and play some big stages, uh, with another, uh, uh, that's actually a country artist in town. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a very different kind of performance when you're playing with a, if we're on a giant stage and you're, you know, 10, 15 feet away from everyone else in the band. I really prefer myself, uh, in terms of, uh, and you're playing to a click track and, you know, I think it's much more you know, to the clock and everything is, you know, there's not a lot less expression, right? Everything is really over rehearsed on, on that kind of level. Um, but uh, in terms of, uh, uh, I prefer to play small venues. So, you know, there's quite a few small venues we play often and where people are there, there's no background, you know, music that you're, you're I should say, there's no, you're not playing over people talking and not paying attention. You know, they're really there. Uh, there's nowhere to go because they, it's small and you're basically, you know, they're front row and center to your performance and they react to it, you know? So I really enjoy feeding off of that. And that, that, you know, that brings us, you know, to our stank faces pretty easily. Um, but you see the bigger the venue, you know, it's just, it, it becomes more, of, a little different, right? You don't have less interaction, less of that feedback. And so it's become more, more siloed in a sense. So I really, you know, for our band anyways, for this band, you know, we feed off each other and, you know, it, it gets created pretty much, organically most of the time you know we, we never rehearse so it's always unique and different when we play and we always surprise each other you know so it's always feeding off of that and so the smaller the venue kind of accommodates that yeah, that's awesome because yeah you were talking about your experimental roots before and it seems like the band continues to be experimental with how spontaneous you guys play oh, and yeah. just play off of each other that's a vibe yeah. and a half for sure and we'll mix genres, you know, and we'll, we'll try all kinds of stuff live. And sometimes so I'll, I'll drop in rhymes over, you know, just make them up on the fly. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting. So there's, there's like a freestyling component to your live performance. No question for this band. There's no question. Yeah. It's, it's definitely comes out of performance. That's very cool. Now you've mentioned people like Tupac and Marvin Gaye. I'm just wondering who would your dream musician to work with be? I think I would love to work with D'Angelo, you know, so nineties, Neo soul. Mm -hmm. um you know when i first heard d'angelo in the mid 90s the brown sugar album you know it kind of blew my mind you know it's the first time i'd really heard neo soul and uh um so you know just that vibe of uh of of soul music but you know bringing it to a to a different uh different different kind of generation and you know making it really uh you know like lauren hill and people like that joe scott you know and that whole kind of uh maxwell you know it's all those artists really introduced me to Neil soul. Um, but if I could just m mention, you know, even, even, uh, so I think he would be one person, but if I could choose a band, um, it would have to be zero seven, you know, so I discovered zero seven, you know, the down tempo genre, you know, a few years after that. And that changed my complete perspective of music and of, of terms of what it could be. And this, you know, using electronic uh, instruments, but jazz, you know, Rhodes piano grooves, and uh, so once I first heard Zero Seven and, you know, you, you probably hear that influence in our music, you know, um, it's extended, you know, jams with, you know, Rhodes piano solos and really just stanky, stanky vibes, you know. <laughs> um, so, and, they, and that turned me on in the entire genre of, of down tempo and, uh, you know, I'm still into it now. So <laughs> that's very cool. So I watched your music video for Dopamine Dreams um on youtube the other day and i have to say it was an experience to say the least i'm curious what the like inspiration was to create such a spectacle well yeah so the song is really about misinformation in social media right and uh more specifically you know um, um you know fake news or, or even like the the monetization of anger you know by ai because you know that's that, that's what gets your eyes staring at the screen and, and clicking more right is so um i had this concept of how do I kind of how do I visualize misinformation and so I had a few different concepts that I pitched to the to the videographer Peter uh, Maurer you know one of the top guys in Ottawa you know he did a brilliant job on it he got nominated this year for a, a, 
a video he did last year on for the um, Ottawa Industry Music Coalition um, awards. You know, he didn't win, but you know, he got nominated. So hopefully next year uh, he'll get nominated again for our video. And uh, so it was really how do I visualize uh, this concept of living in uh, a cyber world of you know of misinformation. And so uh, you know the the kind of uh, the the neon uh, you know goggles uh, kind of symbolize you know being in that space and the colors. And uh, if you watch the video, you know it's, it's very clear that you know this person gets sucked into this world. And uh, you, you don't see it as much. It's a little more uh, subliminal, but there's a lot of messaging you see projected on uh, some of the words like deep state or, you know, fake news or, you know, those types of things, uh, you know, kind of symbolizing this, this, this kind of uh, free for all of, of, you know, what's information, what's news, what's knowledge, you know, and, and, and how to, you know, how it just gets uh, to be kind of confusing. Yeah, well, I wanted to thank you for your time today, Mark, for thank you very telling much. us about your band, Mecca of Stank. But before we go, I was just wondering, is there anything you'd like to plug? Uh, no, I just check us out online. We're, we're playing this weekend at uh, have three gigs this weekend, so a busy weekend for us. Um, but come check out Sunday, Tavern in the Falls at 2 p.m. You know, it should be a good venue. If you, one of the beautiful patios of Ottawa uh, overlooks the Rideau Falls. And uh, check it out at 2 o'clock. We're playing there, so full band and it's going to be hopefully it's sunshine and it'll be a good show right on all right thanks a lot mark thank you very much for watching make sure you tune into my show on tuesdays at 2 p.m bird on a wire only on ckcu 93.1 fm